Hello and welcome to IABSI in Conversation, where I, David Knight, talk to eminent and interesting designers and structural engineers about what inspires them and their life and career. I'm delighted to be concluding our first series by welcoming Ian Firth as my guest. Ian is a structural engineer and bridge designer with a portfolio that stretches from the longest to the shortest bridges. I believe he's the only structural engineer to have given a TED talk on the main stage and has spent almost his entire career at Flint and Neal, now part of Corby. I should say that I used to work for Ian at Flint and Neal, so I'm not a wholly independent reviewer this time round. But let's start before we get to Flint and Neal. Um, we've talked a bit in the past, Ian, about your childhood, and I understand that at least part of it was spent growing up in Denmark. Um, what was that like, and what was it taking you overseas? Well, um, yes, I, indeed, my mother was Danish, and uh, so uh, I had Danish uh, connections, Danish relations and so on. Uh, and although when I was little, I didn't spend very much time there, one of my enduring sadnesses is that I didn't uh, learn Danish when I was little. Uh, my mum, uh, having married a, an English naval officer at the end of the Second World War, was rather made to feel that she was supposed to be British now and, and that the this sort of Danish nonsense was to be put behind her. Such was the sort of English attitudes at the time, I think. Um, uh, so that never happened. Um, but yes, Denmark, a beautiful, beautiful, lovely place. And of course, a place where design is is kind of front and central, I think, in many ways. I mean, anybody who arrives in a, in a Danish airport or station, you know, can't possibly miss the fact that somebody's thought hard, long and hard about how to, to you know, this, this place is designed and materiality and so on. And, and Danish design, Scandinavian design, whether it be in, in buildings and structures or whether it be in jewellery and furniture and uh, and other things. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I choose um, to use um, Danish uh, objects to drink out of. Um, you know, it just happens to be uh, everywhere. And whether that was part of part of what led me into this world, I don't know. Um, I don't, it certainly wasn't a, a conscious process. Well, I was going to ask whether there was anything in, in that growing up environment, is there, is there anything in your background that, that pushed you into engineering or was it just a, uh, something that suited your skills at school? Uh, it, well, interesting. Um, I've often wondered about this. My dad, bless him, was a, was a wonderfully practical guy. He's a naval officer. He joined, joined in the war. And, and, um, uh, but he was a wonderfully practical guy and I learned a lot from him just doing stuff around the house, making things. Um, so, so growing up making stuff was, and, and actually uh, both you know, practical stuff, but also just models and, and, and toys and things uh, was, was part of my daily existence. Um, <clears throat> so I think that was just something that was inevitable. I was going to find myself doing things which re required a sort of creativity, some sort of creative process. Um, and he, he undoubtedly was responsible for that, and, 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 I, and I thank him daily for that. Um, but no, there was no other engineering directly in the, in, in the world. My, my elder brother, who well actually, as you know, David, um, is an artist, a sculptor. Uh, and um, he, uh, you know, the, he also, because he was four years my senior, and, and uh, you know, very much, you know, growing up with an older brother like that, you know, you're going to sort of um, respect what they're doing and, and learn from them and so on. Uh, and he was very artistic from a very early early stage, so the artistic stuff was there, um, and I see very engineering very much as an art as much as anything else. Um, well, it, uh, I was going to come on to it a bit later because I was really interested in that relationship between um, your work, but also how that works in relationship to architecture and also art. So you're mm -hmm. you're obviously known for. Um, collaborations with leading architects you've got a vast experience in what are sometimes frustratingly called architectural footbridges but yes <laughs> with your brother as a sculptor and um, you're an accomplished sketcher and, and, yeah. and musician you know it, is that practice of art in in, in how you view it and, and, and it's a collaboration with design is that essential to the role of an engineer and, and your practice well, yeah, I wouldn't say it's essential, but 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 certainly, you know, if you're going to be the sort of engineer that wants to design things, and particularly in my world, bridges where you know the thing you're designing is 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 acutely visible. I mean, it's 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 all about the visual impact. Then yes, it's a piece of art. We are making a a work of art. I mean, you, you know, the, the French even use that phrase to, to mean a bridge. You know, um, uh, a work of art translated in French is a bridge. Um, so yes, artistic, you know, art is absolutely part of, of the requirement. I, um, I, I mean, as many years as employer, 
Um, you know, I would look for people who, you know, if they wanted to come and be designers, I would be saying, well, okay, what else have they got? To the, what other strings do they have to their bow? Not just maths, physics, and you know, further maths, but maybe they've been into music or art or theatre or, or, or drama or you know, whatever it was. Um, something of the arts, and I mean something that we in this country, uh, in England, of uh, the UK anyway, have sadly um, somehow formed this sort of separation that somehow you're either going to be a scientist or you're going to be an artist. Um, uh, but so for me, you've got to have that cross section. You need everything. And does it fit? I, mean, I suppose there's an obvious answer to this, which is yes. But it, how does that fit into your practice? The, the, the concept of art and the concept of the visual language. Are you bringing that into the process or how do you respond oh, yeah. within, within a design process to others in the design team? Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. But I'm not doing it as, as sort of in any way separately as a sort of artist. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. sort of turn on an artist brain and then, then turn on, a, on a, somehow an engineering brain. It's all one and the same. So when I approach a design challenge, I'm going to be thinking about the visual uh, aspects and, and not just visual, but human, social, environmental, mm. Mm. Um, all what some people frustratingly call the kind of softer sides of engineering. Um, <laughs> You know, for me, it's completely inseparable. You can't, you can't somehow sort of, it's not an option. You don't have it or not have it. It's, mm. it's, it's part of what we do. So when we're designing, when I'm designing something, and David, you know, you know this, obviously, because we've worked together on things. But, um, you know, I'm going to be thinking, yes, of course, how is it going to work? You know, what materials is it made of from a, from a technical, structural point of view? How do we make sure we've got enough material to carry the load and all that sort of stuff? But I'm absolutely thinking at the same time and not not before, after or separately, but absolutely simultaneously. I'm thinking, how does that, how's that going to look? How is it going to appear? How's it going to feel? Um, you know, when people uh, uh, encounter it at, at, at whatever level, it's a human thing that we're dealing mm. with. We're dealing with people and their response to the built environment. And, um, so, so I'm trying to think of it from the human perspective. This is what architects, frankly, do an awful lot better than most engineers. But that is because it's part of their training. Mm. Um, and we could do an awful lot better in the engineering world if we had some of that kind of training in our kind of creative design studios and so on. So you, you had that as part of your childhood and then you went on to university to study engineering um, at Bristol. And yep. That presumably was via, via a numerate interest. You're interested in maths and, and sciences yep. and you have sort of pushed down that route. Um, and and you, you left university and, and joined Flint and Neil. And at that stage, Flint and Neil was a relatively small company. What took you to Flint and Neil? Why, why, were you, why did you end up there rather than uh, it's, anywhere uh, else? I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. It's, it's a, it was an extraordinary situation and I, and I thank God for it um, because, it, you know, I'd never heard of Flint and Neil. Um, uh, I had done what I think most of our sort of engineering cohort back in those days, we did three year bachelor's, bachelor's degree and we did, you know, at the end of, I suppose, the first term of the final year, somebody got up at the front and said, you know, you guys, you ought to think about, you know, career and, and what job you're going to do next summer, you know. And, you know, we, we had the kind of usual milk round from the, the big companies. And I interviewed with, you know, Arab, Halcro, blah, 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 went for Palmer and Tritton as they were then, High Point Rental or whatever. That. And all the big names, because people, that's, who, that's who came along. And that's, that's the names we heard about. And actually, I, um, having been refused by Arab, which to this day still hurts, um, I um, was uh, given a job offer with Halcro. And I got to the point where I had something like a week's time before I had to respond. You know, I had to reply, yes, I Out of the blue, I got this letter, which had been forwarded to me. And it was a letter from a chap called Tony Flint, who I'd never heard of, but Tony Flint, uh, uh, the senior partner of Flint and Neil. And he had written to my professor, Roy Seven, and saying, you know, we, we need a graduate. Have you got any, any good ones, you know, that you could recommend? And he had forwarded this letter to, I don't know, three or four of us or something. I thought, this is intriguing. Never heard of these guys. And what's more, he was paying, he was going to offer a, to pay for me to go to London to, for an interview. So I thought, hey, what's, what's not to like? You know? So I got on a train and uh, went to an interview with this firm. And immediately, I mean, literally, you know, sitting down opposite Tony Flint, 
um, uh, and and just being in that environment, I thought this is this is different. This is there was something about this, the people. Anyway, so to cut a long story short. Um, he offered me a job. It, it, it also helped that he was offering slightly more money than Halcrow was, um, <laughs> and so um, I joined them uh, in September 1979, and I've never looked back. I mean. Some people say, so I listened to, to some of your other interviewees, for example, and uh, seen their, their story moving through um, different companies and, and, and traveling around doing, doing very different things. My work has all been through that one organization, which eventually, as you, as you said in your introduction, became part of COVID. Um, but uh, Flint and Hill has been fabulous. So they were doing sort of interesting I would say cutting edge stuff. I mean, we were, we, were, we were quite commonly working on the edges of the kind of known, should we say codified way of doing things. Quite a lot of our work was, was, was sort of dealing with stuff that others don't deal with because maybe there wasn't a, a, a kind of standard way of doing stuff. And it was, it was really interesting, really, really interesting stuff. And, and um, I, as I say, I never look back. So that letter that landed on my doormat that day back in 1979 was uh, was a great day and it's interesting the list of companies you give there and were you very focused on bridges at university you knew that bridges were where you wanted to go or was it a more general well i'm, I'm a structural engineer i want to be involved in in making new things and, and bridges just happened to be the route that you took I, I think it was almost accidental i mean yes bridges i mean i did a, I did a project on on, on bridges uh, at university, I, I well, one of them. I mean, a design project. Um, I think, I think, in a way, yes, bridges and structures. I, I knew it wanted to be structures. I mean, obviously, at university, you do the whole thing, but you do hydraulics and geotechs and all the rest of it. Uh, and I was interested in structures again because it was the kind of making things, and I sort of got, got, got excited about that. Um, uh, and Flint and Neil back then weren't just bridges. Um, I mean, well, they never have been, but I mean, they, they obviously they have a name, particularly for bridge work. But back then, I mean, we were doing the National Theatre, we were doing the Baha'i temples, we were doing, um, you know, fascinating building structures. Um, I was just interested by, by structure. Yes. Um, and I think more than anything else, by people, by the people doing it. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things about that Flint and Neil that I, I grew to love very quickly was the relatively small sort of family atmosphere um, of, of a, a bunch of people, very capable people, able to, to tackle all sorts of, of unusual tasks, but, but, but pe you know, people who are really working together like a sort of a small team. And of course you get that at a larger scale as well, of course you do. Um, and and that's, that's one of the joys of the profession we work in. Um, but no, I think Bridges, are, you know, it became part of what I, what I did. I, mean, I went off after a few, you were probably going to come to this, but I'll, I'll ju jump the gun. And I went off after a few years to Imperial College to do a, 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 a master's degree in structural steel design which was not bridge focused specifically, but obviously it was steel focused. Mm. But it just so happened that when I came back from that, uh, and I don't want to steal your, 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 your question line, uh, if, if you were going to come to this, but what I, when I came back to that, from that, I was immediately immersed in a major steel bridge project. Um, and that kind of set the path, I think, for what came, what right. came about. You obviously have my list of questions in front of you because you're creating <laughs> know, exactly. a whole series. But um, I, I was going to come on to that major project early, early, um, early stage in your career. Relatively young engineer, uh, especially by today's standards. But you were you were heavily involved in the strengthening of the Y Bridge. It must have been in incre incredibly formative, I suppose. How did well, you yeah. come to the stage where you were you were a senior member of the team on that, and and, and what did it involve? Well, <laughs> frankly, I remember it so well. Um, you know, I did the, the, the course at Imperial College, which thanks again to the partners at Flint and Neal at the time, who enabled it to happen. Um, uh, and it was an extraordinary time. And that, that course is absolutely brilliant. And I came back, you know, literally the first day back, uh, we're talking, um, uh, you know, summer, I suppose, 1982. And um, I thought Tony Flint had lost his marbles because he, 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 he sat me down and he said, we, we're engaged in this really uh, major uh, project uh, with the Seven Crossing. This is the old um, famous suspension bridge, Seven Crossing. And, uh, and um, many people know about the Seven Bridge, but actually if you drive over the Seven Bridge from England towards Wales, um, 
you then immediately off the back of, you come off the back end of the Seven Bridge, you immediately drive down a viaduct, known as a cable stayed Y bridge across the River Y, all part of the same crossing. And um, he put me in charge of the team that was going to do the assessment and ultimately the design and strengthening, uh, although at that point we didn't know that we were going to be doing design and strengthening, um, of the, the Y, that viaduct and the Y bridge, 1.3 kilometers of steel box girder. One of the first steel box girders of its sort built in the world. As you know, the Seven Bridge was a was groundbreaking piece of, of engineering, 1965. Um, and, um, you know, this was extraordinary. And I, and I you know, me, <laughs> I've just come out of, I just come out of university. I, I, you know, I'm still green behind the ears. Anyway, um, so it was an extraordinarily formative time. Um, I had a wonderful team around me. Um, and it was uh, needed a, a very high degree of, of rigor and focus in terms of the analysis of what we had to do. Um, and then, as I say, we eventually ended up having to do the strengthening, which turned out to be an extremely innovative thing because we actually had to do a recabling process while the structure was carrying traffic. So with all traffic running on the bridge, we changed the, the cable stay system, replaced all the old cables, put on new cables in a, in a bridge where the old cables were unreplaceable. Um, so this was, this was big challenging stuff. I have to say it took a long time. Um, there was a point, several points, I think, along those, I don't know, eight, ten years or something, when I thought, gosh, am I ever going to do anything other than this? <laughs> 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 uh, but it, I mean, it certainly, and of course I did do other things, but, but it felt like it was such a major project. Mm. Very exciting, wonderful thing to work on. And, it, and very soon after the completion of that project, you were uh, appointed a partner at Flint and Neil at, at 34, which is, I, I think an extraordinary early age, um, although um, the, the size of the business and there's has changed dramatically since then. It must have been quite a step up personally for you uh, and give yeah. you massive exposure to, to a side of engineering, a business side of engineering that perhaps hadn't been part of your, your training to that stage. I think, I think that's true. Um, I think that's true. It certainly was a big step up. I mean, it was an extraordinary offer um, and, and opportunity. Um, uh, and you know, I'm I'm very very grateful for for that. Um, yeah, all of a sudden, um, you know, you're not just doing the engineering that uh, we have been trained to do, as it were, uh, but you're also managing a bunch of people and a business. Um, uh, thankfully, I was very much the junior partner, and so you know, I was very I, still uh, in awe of, of Tony Flint, Brian Smith, the two senior partners at the time. John Evans also joined at the same time, and 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 a, a extraordinarily. Um, able guy who came from a, a fabrication background, steel fabrication background. Um, and I mean, you know, it's an amazing team and, and we learned an awful lot together. Uh, a, a great joy to work together with, with people who you have a huge respect for. You have to have in partnership, obviously, 100% um, trust and respect. And, and, and it was a genuine partnership, um, uh, you know, the good old fashioned uh, model. Uh, you don't see so many of them these days. Um, so the shelf on my back was, 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 you know, at risk as it were. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that certainly focused the mind, um, somewhat thinking about, you know, what happens if anything goes wrong. Um, and I think actually that, that, that rigor, that, that focus for ensuring that what we were doing, particularly because we were working outside the box, sometimes we were doing things which were not straightforward, codified, you know, established technology, we were having to do things which were a bit different. We had to feel and find our way very cautiously. Um, and I think that that's still that focus is still there to, even today. Um, it's about working very closely to understand the basics, the physics, the fundamental basic principles about what we're doing, not just applying some formula because it happens to be in a book, you know. That was that under underscored everything we did. Still does. Hmm. There was a uh, moving on slightly from from the strengthening work. There was a, a, a in retrospect quite an old period around the time of the millennium where where footbridges were what local authorities wanted to spend their money on. Yeah. Um, you had preempted this a little bit by winning the the Pool Harbour competition in 1997, which wasn't a footbridge but was a was a, um, a, a very spectacular scheme across Pool Harbour with Dissing and Vitling. And um, Flint and Neil weren't 
weren't well known for bridge design per se at that point. So how, how did all of that come about? So Flint and Neil had got a, a, a reputation for being, you know, design checkers, assessors, um, sort of forensic investigators, doing things which were a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, uh, they were, we were referred to as the consultant's consultant. The other consultants would come to us for a second opinion, you know, kind of thing. Um, and yes, as you say, we were not doing a great deal of new design. Um, the highways agency, as it was, um, before I was England, in fact, it might even still have been before that, it might have been just Department of Transport, I can't remember when that changed over. But anyway, they announced this competition. And uh, at that stage, we're talking mid 90s, um, at that stage, um, competitions were not, in, in our world, were not common. You know, the, yes, in the architectural world, they were, they were common. But uh, this was an uh, unusual thing. And I remember um, going to the partners saying, gosh, we should do this. You know, this is, uh, this is just so brilliant wonderful things to do. And they said, don't be so stupid. Don't be so silly. You know, we, we, we don't have a, a name for this, you know, and they reeled off, um, you know, 20 names of, of other companies that I could do now, if you, if you, if you like, and name all our competitors, um, uh, to, that, that would be more likely to win this thing. But I'm a belligerent sort of chap, and I, and I just kept sort of banging on the door and say, come on, don't be so silly, let's have a go. Anyway, so they, they kind of, I think more than the other, Freud just shut me up and anything else. I said, okay, give it a go. Knowing this was a three phase competition and the chances of getting past phase one was pretty slim, all right? Phase one was an open competition. And he, they, they even allowed me a budget. They said, okay, you know, we said, well, how much money are we going to need to spend on this? Anyway, the, the, so that was the first coup. The second coup was to actually go and talk to this thing about thing and get them to join us. They, had been um, had become very well known as the architects of the Great Belt Bridge, the, big, the wonderful suspension bridge uh, in Denmark. Um, and it just so happened that Paul Over Jensen, one of their partners, was in town uh, for a conference. And I plucked up the courage to go and say to him, to, to introduce myself to him, and say, "You don't know me. You never met me from Adam. You don't know who I am. Never heard of Lindsay Neil. But how about this competition?" I have no idea what made him say yes. Uh, it might have been the rather expensive drink I bought him at the top of the Hilton Hotel. But, but I, anyway, the fact is that, well, he and I are now very, very dear friends, but um, he said yes. Um, and uh, I suppose the rest is history. But, but, but I mean, what, was, what was astonishing was that we did get through the first phase. Um, uh, I think, you know, the partners then rolled their eyes and thought, oh, gosh, we're now going to give me more money to do phase two. Um, uh, anyway, we went on a wonderful thing, um, which sadly never got built, as you say. I mean, it, it, it was an extraordinary thing. I remember it so well, 12th night, January the 6th, 19... 97 um when it, the announcement was made and, and i i mean you know i was astonished but um you know wonderful win and yes that was a bit of a that was a bit of a milestone for me and did that lead to uh, a, a sort of new interest in british design did that you know start to you in the in the in the route of going well that's a that's now an achievable project to aim for we can do that design piece of work and that design piece of work in addition to our checking and assessment work yes i mean you, you know i think obviously you win a competition so what i mean uh, you know that could could just be a fluke um and and um you know i i, I want to be careful not to take too much credit here i mean yes i pulled a team together yes we worked together and yes uh, you know I, I i'm sure that the team around me uh, would consider that i i contributed significantly but but you know it is a team effort and and what i what it showed was that that part of me, we talked earlier about the sort of the artistic part of me, if you like, which at that point, until that point had been, been somewhat subdued, uh, suppressed, because we were doing other stuff, you know, mm. um, suddenly came to the front. And, and in that year, that was January 1997, I was immediately approached by some other uh, architects um, who wanted to work with us, uh, which is, was very flattering. Um, and that would have been nice in itself, but what was even better was we went on to win an awful lot of other competitions. I think, I can't remember what the number is. I think 1997 we did six competitions and won four of them or something. Um, you know, it was extraordinary. I mean, totally and utterly extraordinary. Um, and and, and I, suddenly we were kind of on a roll, you know, um, and we've, we still are. Oh, I still am. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are, there are many fewer bridge competitions in the UK nowadays. I mean, as you said, you know, this was around the turn of the millennium and, and uh, you know, all of a sudden every town in, in England wanted to have a footbridge as their kind of millennium project. 
Mm. Uh, so there are a lot of competitions. Um, and it, it, what was what was interesting, and I mean, I would say it was great, some would disagree, uh, was that it brought into bridge design a whole new raft of, mm. of, of players. Uh, and I worked with, with a number of them. Um, but um, no, it, that was the time when Wilkinson Air started to really make waves. Uh, we saw their work in, in the Docklands, the Doc London Docklands Development Corporation were building footbridges like there was no tomorrow. They were doing it, Future Systems was doing it. Um, you know, there were others, um, Lichutz Davidson, of course. Um, and, and all of a sudden we got architects working in bridges. Mm. Um, and, and I love it. I mean, I, I work very, very comfortably with, with, alongside uh, architects. They come with a slightly different perspective. Their starting point is perhaps a little different. I mean, mine is probably much quite similar to theirs, actually, in many, in many ways, because of, you know, just my background or something. Um, uh, but, but, you know, it is really interesting how I really value that, that mm. process of bringing together those two minds the kind of creative process where, you know, you have multiple disciplines all focused on the same challenge um, uh, and, you know, not, not afraid to speak into somebody else's discipline. You know, the, the most effective design process, I think, is when you get to the end and you can see this beautiful thing that you've come up with as a team and you can't actually say who had which idea. So I'm, I'm just as much wearing an architect's hat as they're wearing an engineer's hat or the lighting designer's hat or the landscape architect's hat or whatever. We're just in it together and we're all contributing and we're crossing over. And that's that wonderfully, well, it's enjoyable, but it's a wonderfully sort of fertile creative place, place out of which good design emerges. And it's, it's actually really interesting looking at it now, how many of the big names in British design are really cut their teeth in that era of, of, of architects becoming yeah. involved in, in what had been engineering structures beforehand. Um, your, your relationship obviously with Paul Ove carried on. Um, and I want to sort of talk a bit about your work in Hong Kong after, after that, uh, yeah. first on, on Ting Kao and Cap Chi Mun, but also the fantastic competition win for Stonecutters Bridge. Yeah. Um, Wybridge obviously was a long, longish span, but but the, getting into the super long span bridges or um, proper proper long span bridges, some might say that 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 must have been quite a an exciting period. Well, it certainly was. I mean, Flint and Neil had always been in that sort of space. Um, you, you know, uh, Tony Flint had had written about long spans. Um, you know, there was a design from the nineteen sixties for a channel crossing. Uh, which I came across in the archives, and, you know, um, before my time. But but you know, long spans have been around, and, and uh, Flint and Neil had got a name for uh, aerodynamics, for example, bridge aerodynamics. Uh, a lot of the thinking um, which is now enshrined in all our codes for bridge aerodynamics in, in this country um, came out of out of work that Brian Smith and Tony Flint did, uh, along with people like Tom Wyatt and and, and others. Um, but you know that so so long span bridge aerodynamics was something which we absolutely knew something about. Um, you know that was part of our DNA, and and um, you know so long spans weren't weren't I wasn't frightened by long spans. We say um, uh, so so it was a completely natural thing to be to be thinking long spans. Yeah, Stonecutters came along. It's another one of those competitions that everybody wanted to do. You know, I'm rather like with with why. I mean, I think with the what the, sorry with the pool. The Pool Harbour competition, there were 99 entries in that first stage, which was when we went through uh, that first phase. Um, and I think, I can't remember the number that Stonecutters, but again, there was a good number in the sort of first stage before they whittled down to a, to a short list. Um, and um, so, you know, we went for it. I mean, obviously we already had, by that stage, we had a relationship with Dissinger Weitling. Uh, they were the obvious candidates. They had already got a name for the big spans. They'd done the still belt, the Great Belt Bridge in Denmark. Uh, they'd been involved with a number of other large bridges already by that time. Uh, so they were very comfortable and happy to join us. Uh, we obviously also had Halkro with us at that time, um, and also Smitty, Smitty, the Shanghai Municipal Engineering Design Institute. Uh, we felt it was important to have a Chinese element in our team. Um, but, uh, I mean, Stonecutters was an extraordinary win, again. We were, were delighted with that. Um, 
Yeah, let's talk a second about the design. I mean, you, you know, for, and I, th I think this is where actually I go back to Denmark. It's interesting. I was working with a Danish designer um, because one of the wonderful things about Scandinavian design, and I'm sort of winding the clock right back to the beginning, is, is and I can only use the word simplicity um, because, it, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's all about simple proportion, clarity, you know, it's not complicated stuff. Um, so you look at your Jensen Silver or you look at any of the, 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 the sort of design stuff, you know, Arnie Jakobsen furniture or whatever, it's, it, it's just nice and clean. And if you look at stone cutters, I think you'd agree that that's mm. what that is. It's very, very simple. A lot of the other designs have a sort of an extra level of complexity about them. Um, and so, you know, we were so delighted with that. And, and, and that is, that is my, my genre, if you like, that is the kind of design I want to go to. There's that old adage, isn't it? You know, the right, right solution, was it Mies, was it Mies van der Rohe? Yeah. The right solution is where you can't take anything else away, you know? Um, and so that's what Stonecutters was. And, and again, we won that one. Of course, what happens in that particular case was the way it had been set up um, by Arab and the highways department in Hong Kong um, was that uh, winning the competition didn't necessarily win you the job. Super frustrating, but, but there we are. Uh, there's a nice little sort of footnote to that story though, of course, is that Arab who did end up winning the job, um, uh, ended up employing Kobe as their subcontract consultant to do the design of the, the main bridge. So kind of came full circle when Flint and Neil joined Kobe. It was an interesting little sort of <laughs> piece. <laughs> well, I was going to lead on to that. So sort of, um, having well, I keep been... jumping the gun with you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, as I say, I, I, I'm sure you're reading my questions. Um, in, so in about 2008, um, having been a, um, a, a, a partnership for a very long time, um, you were one of two remaining partners at Flint and Neal, uh, and you took the uh, took decision to set, sell the company to Coe, uh, and it must have been a, a bit of a change. What was the background to, to that? Had it been coming for a while, or was it a, a a, a, a grow a, a desire to grow into those those different markets that can we help i think with. i think i mean it's interesting there's a sort of variety of things that were, were growing with us i mean we were we were a wonderful unit um and the great thing is that we're still very much the same people even today um uh, enjoying doing what we were doing and finding ourselves as a small organization punching well above our weight all right you've mentioned long spans we were working on the, some of the longest spans around the world um, you know, at this point, I was advisor on the Messina Bridge project, um, the longest span, you know, as yet unbuilt. Um, uh, you, you know, we were we were dealing with with some of the biggest um, projects, but we were quite a small entity. Um, and um, you know, I think David McKenzie, my partner at the time, uh, uh, and I, you, you know, began to wonder whether, um, you know, with a, a greater degree of muscle around us, uh, a greater resource. Um, um, we were able to, we would be able to do this stuff, but even better, you know, and provide a greater opportunity for our staff um, and actually begin to to become known, not just as the kind of consultant who advises on, but the consultant who does, mm. you know, consultant who does. Um, and um, I mean, Covey obviously was a company that we knew and, and loved and, and had worked with and worked, you know, we'd competed with them, we'd worked with them, we'd, we'd you know, we, we, we sparred with them, we respected them hugely. Uh, and interestingly, over in Vancouver was a company called Butler and Taylor, who, um, you know, if we sort of scanned around the planet to think about who else was rather like us, doing the same kinds of thing we do with the same sort of mindset, the same sort of value, value set, Butler and Taylor would have come out probably top of that list. And we looked at them and we thought, well, you know what? They're part of the Kobe group. And there had been, I think at that stage, they had already been by I don't know, 12, 14, 15 years or something. And they were still buckling and Taylor. They were doing the same stuff they would had be, always been doing. And they'd got a really good name for cutting edge engineering, particularly in the bridge world. But they were part of the Kobe group and, and they had all of that extra support and extra muscle around them. Um, and it so happened that period uh, for, for, for years, uh, years earlier, um, the, at that point, that time, um, chief executive of, of Coe had approached Flint and Neil, Tony Flint in those days, uh, for, you know, say, hey, how about, how about joining up, you know? And at that time, the, you know, it wasn't the right time and Tony Flint had said, no, thanks. But I thought, well, this is worthwhile having a conversation at least to see whether there might be something in it. 
And so, you know, to cut a long story short, the, the rest is history. We, we had that conversation and, and, and um, Corey were interested in us and we became interested in them and it looked like it was the right kind of synergy. It was, you know, we brought our skills to the table, which were very much complementary, uh, overlapping, of course, to an extent. Uh, but, um, you know, they liked what we, we did, we liked what they did and, and um, you know, end of 2008, we, we joined up and it was a very mutually, it wasn't in any way a kind of one person reaching out to another. It was very much mutually coming together thinking this is something which is to our mutual benefit. And, and I has it, it's been successful since then, hasn't it? Has it fulfilled yeah. those, those desires and dreams of, of giving oh, you a... Completely, completely. And I mean, it has given us the opportunity. I mean, you know, look at some of the things we've been doing since. I mean, we would never have done, we would never have led the design joint venture on Mersey Gateway, for example. Um, uh, we would never be doing what we're doing on the Lower Thames Crossing, for example. You know, I could, I could reel off a number of things where the major projects are being led by our people, the same people who were directors, friends, partners, whatever you call them back in the day. Um, now as part of the COE mm. uh, uh, sort of framework. We couldn't have done it. Mm. Because, I, I mean, we, we could because we had the capability, but we didn't have the resource, we didn't have the muscle, we didn't have, frankly, the, um, uh, the believability that a client or a contractor would look at us and say, oh, they, you know, that little organization, they couldn't possibly do it. Mm. Mm. So we have all that. But the great thing is we still have that small, small firm mindset which says we can do the the unusual we can do the little complex little bit of engineering mm. which is where you know we, we learn a lot of stuff you've mentioned this already that you're you've essentially stayed your entire career at one one firm and, and you really stand out compared to my previous interviewees on that you've become extremely well known in the industry through your skills as a communicator you're obviously president of iStruct you had a long involvement i have had and continue to have long involvement in IABC and elsewhere was there ever a plan or or a, 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 a desire to go in a particular direction did you know okay. what you wanted to do and where you wanted to go or was it all what? circumstance a plan <laughs> what's that um uh, no i mean no absolutely not um no you know, you kind of do, I suppose my education and my kind of sort of upbringing um, was about taking opportunities as they present themselves, um, about uh, overall about just being a, a kind of honest, open human being who, who is interested in stuff, interested in things around them, interested in people. Um, and, you know, I think the communicate, you mentioned communication. I mean, I, I, yes, I, I suppose I think of myself as a reasonably good communicator. I mean, I could talk for England, but, but actually it's, it's about just engaging with, with things. When I mean, people talk to me and say, say I'm an extrovert, I'm not sure I really am, but, but I, 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 you know, I'm interested in what goes on around me and, and I'm not afraid to, to offer an opinion. Uh, sometimes it's completely inappropriate, but you know, uh, <laughs> um, you know, and 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 so I suppose somehow along the line, uh, you know, and I I got involved in the institution of structural engineers relatively early on. Um, they were forming the new southeastern counties branch, which was headquartered in Croydon. I obviously found myself in the wrong meeting at the wrong time because I signed up for the early committee, the initial committee. Um, so uh, you know that kind of started me on a bit of a roll. I found myself eventually on council first time round. Um, and you know, little by little, somebody says, oh, this guy first, you know, we, he's quite useful. We can we can put him on this committee or on that task group or something. And I'm gullible enough to say yes. Um, uh, but actually more than that, I think, you know, I, I, I really valued what it was that the institution stood for, the, the importance and value of a professional organisation that that, that promotes um, competence and, and excellence and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so, yes, it was an extraordinary honour when I, I was asked if I would consider going on the kind of the ladder, as it were, towards the possibility of, of president. Um, uh, and and I, I enjoyed that year enormously. It was extraordinary hard work, um, uh, but a, a, an immense honour to do, uh, to represent the profession worldwide. and and. Um, so I, I continue to be involved there. I absolutely is a rather different organisation, but more like a sort of 
club. I mean, the, the, the interested, like-minded enthusiasts enjoy um, learning from each other, hearing from each other, talking about structures that we design and build. Um, and it's a very much an international focus. Um, uh, and so I'm, I'm very much in, in, enjoy doing that. And when I can, of course, I get to the international meetings mm. uh, right now. Not many of those happening, but um, because I think, you know, it's important as an engineer, particularly the work we do is so international, so global. You know, we, we work in a global village that, that means that most of my work is being constructed somewhere else, you know, um, and we will therefore need to draw on resources from that somewhere else. Uh, and expertise from that somewhere else. So the international bodies, both the Institution of Structural Engineers and IAPSI, both of them very much an international, is such an important part of who we are. So for you, they're, they're ways of, of being an advocate, but also of creating a personal network, a, a group of people, a group of, uh, of contacts that, that might prove useful, as well as that advocacy role, that reaching and giving back. Completely, oh yeah. I mean, one of the first things I do, if I get an opportunity to work on a project somewhere where I have no contact, you know, suddenly there's a, there's a design competition or something for a project in Timbuktu. <laughs> I don't think I've done one there yet. Um, but, but, you know, um, I'll go to either the IAPSI or the iStructT website and look for engineers in Timbuktu, you know, um, because you never know when you might need one. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's useful. Um, but I think more than that, it's, it's just, just knowing that there are people all around the world who are struggling with exactly the same challenges that, that I am, and they may have found a better solution than the one I can think of. Mm. And, and and if they're willing to talk about it, then great, you know. And so that's that forum. It's the forum of shared knowledge, which particularly, not particularly, more and more in this day and age becomes an important thing to do. In the old days, you know, when I was a young engineer, I mean, Tony Flint would have would have had a nightmare of, of, of sharing all our, all our state secrets, you know. Nowadays, I think it's much more about sharing our knowledge. Um, and, 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 you know, because it's about the sort of the global, uh, you know, making the world a better place. And let's do that together because this is no place to hold on to, to, you know, clever intellectual property. Of course we do. Of course we do that because there are times sometimes where it has a commercial edge to it but generally, by and large, share it. I'm slightly afraid to ask this, actually, but a, a career that spans at least 80 bridges, do you have a particular favourite? <laughs> or one that perhaps epitomises what you're trying to say through bridge design? Is the one that you look back on and go, yeah, we got almost everything right on that? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure I would... Um, I would say we got everything right, but anyway, but but I mean, gosh, what stands out? I mean, they're all so different. They're all so, I mean, I always love um, the little bridge of aspiration in Covent Garden, the smallest bridge I've ever been involved with. Um, uh, you, you know, I think what, what do I love about that? Particularly, I think I love the way it evolved, it, it, it emerged. Uh, the architect um, Wilkinson, Jim Air, particularly initially, uh, and I um, sitting in a cafe um, trying to imagine an idea um, and then trying to make that idea happen, you know, um, that sort of wonderfully early creative process um, and then seeing the final thing as built, you know, extraordinary as it is. So that was, that was fun. Um, and that was, a, that was a, a synergy of, you know, idea and technology. How can we make it as much as how, I mean, this, is, this is your world, David, now, you know, how do you, make it as much as design it how can you conceive it without knowing how you're going to build it you know, that was very much at the forefront there um gosh where else do i go i mean stone cutters even though we didn't end up doing it i mean that competition was 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 amazing and and the end result is amazing and do court do credit to arup and kobe for for what they ended up with um you know very faithful to the original um I think some of the little footbridges, I mean, Tapler Bridge, which is one that you worked on, um, uh, quite recent across the Thames. Um, I, you know, I love that and I love the way that evolved. Um, uh, you know, and it's ended up being a real gem. You know, some of the smaller ones tend to be the most uh, enjoyable. 
Um, but uh, no, I mean, I don't think I, I have a favourite. I have lots of other people's favourites. Um, <laughs> Go on then. Uh, if there's one bridge that you wish you designed, I think you know what I'm going to say. I don't know. know what I'm going to say. So, so well, I don't know. Maybe you don't. Um, if there's one bridge I wish I designed, it's the Mio Viaduct in the mm. south of France. Mm. I mean, um, Michel Vierge is an outstandingly brilliant engineer. Um, and of course, he had the idea for the Seven Tower multi span cable state bridge long before the competition that was launched. I mean, he very shrewdly managed to work both for the client and the end deliverable uh, delivery unit. Um, and of course, then Norman Foster, or Foster and Partners, should I say, uh, came along and um, and added their magic to to it, undoubted magic, um, that, that that created something truly spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I say this often, um, but yeah, no, that is that is one that I wish I'd done. I thought Surasons was going to come up. That was on my. Surasons, Surasons, uh, Surasons also is is is. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't get a lot simpler than Surasons. Yeah, exactly. Um, the idea of a stress driven with 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 granite slabs. You know, a couple of stainless steel strips and granite slabs. Um, you know, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Love that simplicity. And you're obviously still passionate about the process of design and and, and how uh, how things go together. And um, you're now an independent consultant. You are um, uh, you do a lot of consulting for Koi as well as as your own. And um, yeah. what what's next for you? Where where are you going now? Oh gosh. Um, I mean, I think it's I think it's just whatever's a, whatever's next around the corner. I, I, I have I have no ambition to build a new sort of mega practice. You know, that's absolutely not the case. Um, if there's some engineering challenges around the corner that that will keep me interested, then that's good. I've got a couple of little projects which, you know, here on my table I can I sort of doodle on for rather too many hours that are good that are good for me. Um, uh, but but just because I enjoy it, I mean, I enjoy the the, the process of drawing. I, I, I actually here's the thing. Um, and, you know, I had not thought of this, but way way back, I'm going to prep school now. No, it's not. No, no. It's it, I was 13. I'd just gone to to Marlborough actually, and I did a project um, uh, in a subject called classical studies. I didn't want to do Latin, so we did classical studies. I did a project on the of Acropolis in in Athens. And part of it was drawing a minute detail, a plan of all the buildings on the Acropolis. And I remember getting kind of distinction and A plus or whatever for this piece of work and being hugely proud of it. But just suddenly thought of it because what I, I got such joy out of just the drawing process. And that, so, so to me, I mean, and again, David, you know me too well, but I mean, I, I'm an old fashioned geek that draws with a pencil and paper, you know that stuff, do you remember that? Um, and, and you know, give me a computer and 3D modeling, and I'm completely hopeless. But give me a piece of paper and a sharp pencil, I'm fine. Or even actually a big fat blunt pencil, even better. Um, and so I really enjoy that process. So if you ask me what I'm going to be doing in the future, I'm hoping it'll be a lot of that, um, helping other engineers, architects, designers, whatever, to realise their ideas by doing the engineering design and drawing, and then probably handing over to somebody like you. Uh, to actually make it happen because you've got all the clever wizard gizmos that you need these days. But um, I, I just love that design process, crystallizing thoughts, ideas on paper. I think it's a great summary actually of, of your career and a, a great place to leave leave this podcast. Thank you for a, a fascinating conversation. I think it only really <laughs> scratches the surface of a, a wide and varied career. If you'd like to know more about Ian, please head to his website, ianfirst.com, and do watch his I Struck T presidential address and his TED talk, both of which are available on YouTube. Ian is the chair of the executive committee of the British group of the International Association of Bridge and Structural Engineering. IABC is a group of designers and engineers that are passionate and inspired about the world around us. To find out more, head to our website, www.iabc.org.uk. This is the last in this series of IABC in Conversation. We hope to bring you more episodes in the not too distant future, but for now, thank you very much for listening.